Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Thomas Cowan. Uh, he's an author. He runs the website Fourfold Healing. Dot com. We're going to talk about uh, his books and his work and uh, cancer, and in particular, uh, the new biology of water. So, Tom, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I actually have a new website. It's called drtomcowan.com. So, that's okay. the better website for people to go to. Is doctor spelled out or is it dr? No, d-r-t-o-m-c-o-w-a-n.com. Okay, very good. Well, Tom, tell me a little bit about your uh, your history. What got you into um, you know health and nutrition and uh, and and science in general? Um, I mean, I grew up fairly normal situation. Uh, I was in uh, surrounded by medical doctors, and basically, I didn't like it and didn't want to be a doctor. So I went to college and didn't like that very much either. So I graduated in three years instead of the usual four. Uh, and then I went to the joined the Peace Corps to teach gardening. And uh, while I was there, I was uh, interestingly given books about the work of Rudolf Steiner and Weston Price. And uh, somehow when I read these two, Steiner on basically the way the world is and Price on nutrition, it somehow hit me that the kind of doctor that I didn't want to be was not the only kind of doctor there was. And it was sort of like a floodgate went off. And this is now probably 43 years ago. And um, essentially, I've been looking into health and medicine and science pretty much every day ever since. So apparently, I was very interested in, in the subject, just not the usual way that people learn these things. Well, what's been your focus within the, uh, the field of medicine? What's most important to you? Helping people by seeing the truth and um, understanding how diseases actually come about. And I think the best way uh, to d describe that is to give you ex an example of the different way that I think versus most doctors. And there's some very simple ones. So, for instance, uh, we all have the experience if you get like a splinter in your finger and you don't take it out, then soon after you'll make pus. Now, if you go to medical school, you learn that pus equals an infection and that's bad. And then you give it anti you give the person antibiotics. But most people uh, looking at that situation would actually say the pus is the therapy for the splinter. And somehow the body has this innate way of reacting because if you don't bother to take the splinter out, it's got to do it in some other way. And the way to do that is to make pus. And so in a funny sort of way, the pus is the therapy for the splinter. And at that point, you're in a fork in the road. So conventional science, so-called in medicine, says the pus is bad and everybody else uh, including anybody with common sense, says the pus is the therapy. Now, obviously, that's kind of a silly example, but here's another one which is more relevant. A lot of people smoke, which is, and they breathe it, breathe in polluted air and all kinds of stuff, and they put in all this stuff in their lungs, and then twice a year they get so-called bronchitis, which is a sort of way of describing pus and mucus in order to get the debris out of your lungs. Now, again, we come to a fork in the road and you go to the doctor and he says, you have bronchitis and you're gonna die or, bad, or have bad things happen unless I give you an antibiotic. And the, on the other hand, most people would say, the mucus and pus is there to help you get the debris out of your lungs. Now, the reason this is relevant is, and this is part of the reason I wrote the cancer book, is because 
if you choose the first one and you give people antibiotics twice a year for 20 years, uh, what will happen is you'll build up a bunch of debris in your lungs, right? I mean, what else is going to happen? Cause well, because is, it can't be cleared by natural mechanisms? Yeah, exactly. In fact, when some people say that is that is a way, the mucus and the pus and the coughing and the fever, et cetera, is a way that we clear out toxins, I would disagree with that because I would say it's the only way. It's not a way. There is no backup system. And so if you as a health practitioner don't understand that, you will essentially make it so the person will never be able to clear out toxins from their lungs and they'll build them up. And after 20 years, they'll end up with a toxic mass in their lungs, which is another word for cancer. Now, it's not quite that simple, but if you look at the history of, you know, Hippocrates saying, give me a medicine to produce a fever and I can cure any disease. So that's exactly a, a rephrasing of what I just said. So that's 2,500 years ago. And if you look at Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, sweat lodges, saunas, Gerson therapy, fever therapy, you know, so-called immune therapy, they're all basically trying to get the, mute, the, the, the stuff out of your lungs. And I would contend that if your you know, doctor doesn't understand that, you're going to end up worse because he's actually, he or she is actually going against the innate wisdom of your body. And I sometimes joke that the only thing I remember still from medical school, or the only thing I believe, is the day one when the guy said, just remember the dumbest kidney is smarter than the smartest nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. And right, yeah, it makes sense. And so that's what, true. Um, so, uh, you know, I know that people obviously have natural defense mechanisms for all kinds of, you know, illness and problems, but at what point would you intervene when someone's, um, you know, let's say production of mucus or whatever it is, you know, cytokine production gets to a point where it can damage them or, you know, maybe even kill them? Like, are you saying that medicine is given maybe too early and we need to wait or work for the body's instruction at a later point in a given disease? I mean, you could say that, but having practiced medicine for about 40 years, the amount of times I saw you know, my job it was to help people clear out the the toxins and the mucus in the way their body was intending to. And I could say that in 40 years, I don't remember anybody given appropriate treatment who actually was going to have a bad outcome if I didn't somehow stop it with antibiotics. Now, it's not to saying that I, I would never do that because you know, I probably would. But to base a medical system on this hypothetical worst case scenario of, mind you, of people who don't understand how to help people clear out toxins, how to detoxify, how to not have them put them in in the first place. So we're completely unaware of any strategies to help people deal with this. And then to go saying, you know, well, so, you know, isn't it true that sometimes, of course, sometimes, but that's mostly to base a whole medical system on that is, is kind of nuts, actually. Well, I'm not saying it's the right thing. I'm saying perhaps it'll be better to be okay with having fever for a little bit, be okay with having a cough or mucus or whatever it is for a few days, give your body more of a chance to fight things on their own. And then only if you're deteriorating from there, then maybe intervene. Well, all I'm saying is it would be nice to go to somebody who knows how to work with your natural processes. Because the fact of the matter is there is no medical evidence that a fever of any height or any duration is itself harmful. And if you think otherwise, I'd love to see a study that documents that. Yeah, no, I've noticed that uh, people don't want to have, like all the, all the uh, I guess, you, you know, natural ways that the body uses to fight infection and disease or I guess you could say demonized or at least that uh, medicines are produced supposedly to get rid of them. Like fever appears to be a bad thing. You want to get rid of it. You know, that's what the shelf medications seem to say. And, you know, coughing is bad and mucus is bad and all the medicines seem to want to get rid of these things. But, uh, you know, I'm sure they're very necessary components of healing. Yes, that is true. 
So what are some uh, some examples maybe of more serious cases or just cases that you think are instructive that you, where you've been able to intervene? Like what did you do versus what the person had been doing before or has traditionally done? I mean, you know, all I can say is my whole practice, um, it's, it, it's basically, it, it depends on what disease you're talking about. But, but I think people get sick because they're basically starved or poisoned. And then, you know, th- as a result of that, then bad things happen. But the, the bad things that happen, the symptoms that happen, are generally speaking the body's way of detoxification. Unfortunately, as I said, we misinterpret detoxification symptoms as the disease, and that is much to the detriment of the health of the people. For, for me to get into, you know, to take this or take that, first of all, that's, that's not appropriate because it depends on the individual situation. And no, so, I'm not asking you to say, like, if you have this, do that. I'm just saying, like, examples in the past where you've you've treated someone, you know, obviously no names or anything, but what's an example of your protocol versus maybe a standard protocol that people would expect to take? Like you pick, you know, a couple of examples. Is there anything where uh, it was either I mean, chronic or acute and you were able to help the person? It's that's, that's all I did. I mean, people have coughs and I give them, you know, I tell them what to eat. I tell them what herbs to take to clear out the mucus and, and to help detoxify and have them do detoxification protocols. And as I said, it was extremely rare for anybody to have to do any sort of suppressive therapy given appropriate treatment like that. So have you worked with people with, uh, you know, I guess chronic conditions, uh, you know, let's say they have diabetes or, you know, other conditions like cancer. Have you worked with any really uh, hardcore ones? And, you know, what was an example of of a protocol or a situation that worked out well? I mean, I work with all those and, you know, basically it's, it's the same. People get sick because they, they're either starving or poisoned in various ways. So, you know, and I have a whole book on treating heart disease. I have a whole book on, you know, how and why people get cancer and what to do about it. Um, I have a whole book on treating autoimmune disease. So, you know, people can read about what my treatment protocols are for that. And there's, numerous numerous cases of people that i've worked with with all three of those well maybe take an example from cancer you know what uh is there a memorable story you have about someone that came to you that had a particular type of cancer and you know what was their situation what did you do to help them so i i don't think that's really an an appropriate uh way to go about this because you know, first of all, I don't want to get into the whole treatment protocols. And like I say, there's cases in the book. And the point, the point I'm trying to make is every situation is different, which is also one of the ways that I look at medicine differently. In conventional medicine, they treat diagnoses. So everybody with rheumatoid arthritis gets the same thing. Everybody with strep throat gets the same thing. The interesting thing about the history of medicine is there is no medical system that basically saw the world like that. With Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Native American medicine, homeopathic medicine, they never thought like that. They basically said each situation is individual and people have an individual path to whatever their problem is. And the job of a doctor is to understand in what way they ended up having this trouble. Now, I would admit there is something common about people with rheumatoid arthritis or maybe cancer, which is why you can actually describe that. But the the whole point of the medicine that I was doing that I describe in these books is what we have to begin to learn to understand what is the individual story of this person, what happened to them, in particular, how did they get starved or poisoned? And then you can start to remediate that and to say, well, I did this for that or whatever, is, it just doesn't really help the situation. Well, I guess in order for people to, you know, to get an interest to read one or more of your books, you know, they would have a given condition. But in order to give them a little taste or a teaser of, you know, what about examples of how people have starved or poisoned themselves? They didn't even know it. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, so for instance, uh, there was a, a young man who was basically fine. He was 12 years old. And then he, he and his mother decided to go get a flu shot. And then two days later, he was paralyzed from the waist down. And a week later, they were, he was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, he wondered whether it had anything to do with the flu shot. So he went to the doctor and then eventually went to three neurologists, all who, who told him that it had nothing to do with the flu shot. Even though interesting, if you read the package insert to the flu shot, it says that Guillain-Barre is one of the side effects or known things you can see from having a flu shot. We actually know the mechanism of that because flu shots typically have a lot of aluminum, which cause inflammatory reactions, which can end up damaging your nerves. So I saw him about eight years later, and I put him on a uh, diet and, a, and some other things to help eliminate the aluminum from his system. And then six months later, he was basically walking and more or less fine. So that's one example of uh, now, doesn't mean that everybody with Guillain-Barre got it from a vaccine or a flu shot. It could be that they don't eat enough good fats, and so the coating of their nerves is improperly formed. And I would find that out through their history, in which case I would refeed them with fats, and I would expect them also to recover. So when someone comes to you... Um... I guess they'll do like a large questionnaire, obviously, but uh, will they do like a whole series of... I do any questionnaires. Okay. I talk, and I have a very particular way of finding out what their story is. I have a, a very particular line of questioning that I've developed over these 35 years. So I, I can get people essentially by tuning into their more intuitive side. They then are very good at describing what happened to them. And of course, I guide them in the process. And I can usually tell when we're onto something because A, there's usually an emotional connection to that. And B, then I de essentially develop a hypothesis as to what happened. And then we try to remediate it and see how it goes. Do you, do you have them do like a whole um, panel of blood work or in the conversation you're able to glean what to do? I generally do very little blood work because most of the time I don't find it particularly helpful. And usually you don't, you know, I, you can get into why blood tests tend to be misleading or things that you don't actually need to know. Um, for example, you know, a lot of people come to me and say they have low vitamin D based on a 25 OHD test. And so in the early time, I would say, oh, the level is 20, that's low, take 5,000 IUs a day. And then six months later, we would test it and it would be 21. And I would wonder why that was. And then I was heard that maybe it was because they didn't take enough. So I gave them 10,000. And then the level would go down to 19. And eventually then, when you actually read the medical literature on the accuracy of 25 OHD tests, you find that it actually has no connection to whether the people actually have enough vitamin D in their tissues. The reason is, is because there's something like eight to 10 metabolites and just testing one is, is misleading at best and irrelevant at worst. So I no longer do that because it doesn't give me any information. And I can basically do that with pretty much any test that you have. You do hormone levels. How do you know that the hormones are the same in the evening as they are in the morning? And how do you know they're the same Tuesday as they are were Wednesday? And so a lot of people rely on a lot of misleading information. Uh, and I try not to do that. Huh. So for each uh, blood test that's out there, there can be many reasons why the level is what it is. So you don't really find them very useful. Right. So a lot of people come and they'll say they have chronic fatigue. And they found they know, they know it's caused by an Epstein Barr virus because they have antibodies to Epstein Barr virus, and their practitioner told them they have high antibody levels to Epstein Barr. And that's very interesting because if you look at the relationship between antibodies and so-called immunity, so with some 
uh, so-called viral diseases like mumps, if you have antibodies, that means you're immune for life. On the other hand, if you have antibodies to chickenpox, that sort of means you're immune for life, except then you can get shingles, which is a recurrence of chickenpox. And on the other hand, if you have something like hep B and you have high antibodies, then you're not immune for life. That means the hep B is, or hep C is, is hurting your liver. So when you start getting into this, you find out that antibodies basically mean almost nothing. And yet there's literally millions and millions and maybe billions of people who go around testing antibodies to see if they're immune when the science behind uh, high antibodies mean immunity is basically not there. So how would, uh, I mean, so you have your books out there. When people read them, do you figure out that they're able to help themselves to some degree? Or, you know, would they have to see a practitioner like you in order to get help for their conditions? Um, it's an interesting question because, first of all, I don't always know the answer to that. I mean, the, some of the books have been written by, uh, read by, you know, 100,000 people. So I don't exactly know what they did with it or what happened to them. Uh, I know that one thing is there's very few practitioners who actually think like I do. So it's very hard for them to go to a practitioner who thinks like Tom because uh, that doesn't, there's not many. Although I am doing a mentoring program now that I'm actually retired. So I have, you know, 10 or 12 or 14, it depends, uh, practitioners who I'm actually sort of teaching my method. So hopefully someday soon there will be at least 20 uh, practitioners who actually see the world more or less like I do. And for each situation, they have a, a clear sense of how to remediate it. Well, how did you develop this sense of what to do? Like, what was it like? What was your progression like? I just uh, didn't believe what people were telling me and read everything I could and saw what happened with my own eyes. And, you know, for instance, uh, one of the things that I've been instrumental in developing is a medicine for heart disease. Now, of course, I didn't develop this medicine. It's been around for over 100 years. But, you know, we are basically responsible for bringing it to the United States. You know, and I heard about this probably over 40 years ago, and I eventually started researching and looking into the way that it worked and and trying to understand the science of it, because it, it actually, if, if one understands how this strophanthus extract uh, helps people with heart disease, angina, unstable angina, prevents heart attacks, to a certain extent, maybe even helps treat heart attacks if they use it intravenously, but mostly prevention and treatment of heart disease and congestive heart failure. The, the interesting thing about it is it leads you in understanding how it works to question the idea that the reason we have heart attacks is because we have blocked arteries. And so I wrote a whole book on that. There, there is very little proof, if any, that the main reason that we have heart attacks is because of blocked arteries. In fact, really? the big study that was ever done on understanding the reason people have heart attacks uh, it was a study done by an Italian pathologist named Baroldi, who for 40 years did autopsies on people who died of heart attacks. And he came to the conclusion that uh, exactly 40% of the people who die of heart attacks have any blockage at all in the artery leading to that part of the heart that died. And 50% of the blockages came after the heart attack, not before. So if you do the math, you end up uh, understanding that only at maximum 20% of people who die of heart attacks actually have a significant blockage in their artery leading to that uh, part of their heart. Now, if you correlate this with numerous published studies, like the Courage study, studies done in circulation and JAMA and New England Journal, that show that with regard to stents and bypasses, which of course, quote, clear up blockages, they say there is no uh, decrease in future heart attacks, and there's no increase in the length of time that somebody will survive 
as a result of doing stents and bypasses. And then The Lancet in 2018 in, in uh, October did a study showing that people who have stents versus people who had sham stents, they had no relief of their chest pain. So the, there was basically the headline that the New York Times and the Atlantic ran was that stents proven useless because there's no improvement in, in reduction of chest pain. There's no increase in how long you'll live. There's no prevention of heart attacks. And yet pretty much every doctor, every cardiologist, every patient still believes that the reason we have heart attacks is because of blocked arteries when the evidence for that is basically not there. And so I, you know, I went through all the studies, all the science on that, came to the conclusion that there's other reasons people have heart, heart attacks. And you know, what, what are some of those reasons, by the way, for heart attacks in particular? There's basically three. There's an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, specifically a decreased parasympathetic activity. Number two, there's poor collateral blood flow. And number three, there's lactic acid buildup in the heart. And the medicine that we developed uh, called strophanthus seed extract supports the parasympathetic nervous system. It increases the microcirculation in the heart and it gets rid of lactic acid, which is why the pain and cramps and dis destruction of the tissue happen in the first place. So that's one example. And we have in the okay. book, there's scores of people and I've on the website, you know, if you go to Strophanthus, you can see, I don't know, a dozen case studies, some by me, some by the other practitioners that I've taught how to use Strophanthus. What happens, you know, people couldn't walk to the mailbox and then they could. They had um, low ejection fractions, which means low heart function. And they took Strophanthus for a few months and the heart function went to normal. So anybody can look those up and they can read the literature on Strophanthus, they're all posted on my website. So um, what would you call the, the type of doctor that you are or were that now that you're retired? Like if someone was going to look for, you know, a doctor like this, what there would they call no, them? How would they there is no them? title of what I'm doing. I'm doing Tom Cowan Medicine. Well, you should probably give it a title so people can find doctors like you if you get to train a lot of them, you know? Otherwise, how would they know? Uh, we'll, we'll work on that once we have a couple hundred doctors. Okay. Um, is there any closer proxy that people could, you know, look for a uh, functional medicine doctor versus just an allopathic one, or you know, any any ideas for people that uh, maybe they're hearing the same thing from multiple doctors and they want to see if there's other ideas out there? Where would they look? Well, certainly not functional doctors. I I don't usually see eye to eye with most approaches which are called functional medicine. So it's it's you know, I mean. There actually is no answer to that right now. Everybody has to investigate everything that I say. I don't want anybody to believe anything that I say just because I said it. They should look at the studies. They should look at all the published information that I provided. They're all, they're all referenced. Um, this, the cases are all you know clear, and we, we have actual words of the patients, and we're actually trying – we were – in the final stages of having uh, a university study done on the effect of strophanthus seed extract on heart function, but that got canceled due to obvious reasons lately. Um, but there, there really is no answer to that. And uh, it's very unfortunate. So people are pretty much on their own. They have to figure this out for themselves. I can't at this point, uh, you know, give my endorsement to any kind of group of, of practitioners, whether they're homeopaths or herbalists or cardiologists or functional people, I would need to know them as individuals and how they think, because mostly it doesn't agree with how I see the world. What was it like when you first had an inkling that the answers would be different from what you're being told? Like, Do you remember what condition you were researching and when the lights started to go on and you thought, wait a minute, this, this is not making sense? Uh, it never made sense, but I didn't have any other framework to understand it until I started to read uh, Price and Steiner. Uh, what I learned from Price, it's, it's mostly methodology. So, you know, he was a dentist and he decided, you know, he was basically sick of, of just drilling people's teeth and straightening their teeth. So 
it's all about how you ask questions. So he asked really the only question there is to ask about this, which is, is there anybody out there with perfect teeth? Now, the benefit of being a dentist is if he was a, you know, a liver specialist and he said, I want to go looking the world over for people with perfect livers, it would be hard to get a clear answer because we don't really know what a perfect liver is and you'd have to, you know, dissect somebody or whatever. Uh, Whereas teeth, all you have to do is look in their mouth and everybody should have, you know, 32 perfectly straight, no non-diseased teeth, no cavities, no orthodontic problems, nothing. That's what we mean by perfect teeth. Uh, as far as I've seen with Americans, I've actually never seen anybody with perfect teeth. I've asked probably 100,000 people, maybe two or three or 10 or I don't know how many, but almost nobody. So he decided to spend, you know, 10, 20 years looking the world over for people with perfect teeth. Now, the thing with me is when I read that, the thing that struck me was I, I thought his methodology was correct. In other words, he looked and, and saw what he saw. And so some people would say, for instance, humans shouldn't eat dairy products because cow, you know, cow's milk is for baby cows. Right. So that's possible, I would admit. Um, so what Price did was he looked over the world and said, is there anybody in the world who has perfect teeth? Because most of the people with perfect teeth also actually have perfect health. So he said, okay, I'll look and see. And if any of them eat cow's milk, uh, I'll know that that's not right, that cow's milk can be a perfectly appropriate food. Now, maybe that it depends on how you raise the cows. And it may be whether you you know, heat treat the cow, the milk or whether you culture it or whatever. So there, there's probably some details in that. But the conclusion was three out of the 14 groups, or I think that's the number, ate cow's milk. So if anybody tells me cow's milk is not compatible with good health, I think they haven't actually looked at the science. The same with eating meat, the same with eating animal products, the same with eating vegetables. It turns out that all those people ate animal foods and all those people ate good fats and all those people ate plant food. So if somebody says, you know, humans shouldn't eat plant food or humans should only eat raw foods, none of those groups of people that he studied only ate raw plant food. So there is no actual scientific evidence that that creates people or nourishes people to have good health. So again, my issue here is the methodology was correct. And so as soon as I figured out, you know, how to do the methodology, and it, it's different with different diseases and different situations, then you know how to learn things. Unfortunately, we don't test, we don't understand how to help people understand methodology. So we study diet by looking at enzyme content or looking at this nutrient or that nutrient or your functional doctor says, you know, I think this kind of bioflavonoid is good for you. So I'll measure it in your blood. Never mind that it might go up or down for reasons which we don't even understand. And it becomes basically nonsense. Well, how do you approach it then? Uh, You know, if someone has a certain condition, I know it depends on the person and all that, but But how do you even start down that road of of identifying why they're in that state and how they got there and how to help them? I I said that. I ask them questions. I find out in what way they're usually being starved or poisoned. And then I know what to do. You know, here's an, here's, you you wanted examples. So a guy comes in. Anecdotes make it really interesting. That's why I'm asking. So good. Anything that really like stands out. Five years old, this happened probably 10 times in the last 10 years. A uh, guy comes in 65 years old with early onset of either Parkinson's or dementia. And they've heard that I know something about how to help people with that. So they come in and I say, what happened? And they say, oh, you know, I'm getting older. I'm 63 and I can't remember my wife's name anymore. And I can't drive the car and my hand shakes and all this. And so when did this start? Well, it started about four years ago. I was pretty good until then. And, you know, then I started noticing these symptoms. Did anything happen to you then? 
well, not really, except, you know, I went to the doctor and he said my cholesterol was a little high. And so he gave me, told me to eat a low fat or no fat diet. And he put me on a statin drug so I wouldn't have a heart attack. And, you know, I felt a little nauseated and low energy, but I thought that's probably good for me. And then a few months later, I started noticing I was shaking a little bit. And I went to the doctor and he said, I asked him, do you think it could be the statin drug? He said, no, there's no way statins do that. And so now he's three years later and now he's on drugs and they're thinking about putting him in a nursing home or some sort of assisted living because he can't remember how to drive his car to the grocery store. Now, that's a very easy story because it turns out that our nervous system is basically uh, the highest fatty organ, the brain and the nerves, the highest fatty tissue in the body. In fact, mm. if you look at an actual nerve, it's basically like a copper wire and then it has a rubber sheath around it. But instead, the body doesn't, of course, use rubber. It uses cholesterol. In other words, cholesterol is the glue in your brain. Uh, so he basically did two strategies. One, starvation. So he stopped eating fats, which are what we make these uh, insulation bands uh, covering our nerves out of. So okay. that's starvation. And number two, he took a, a drug that's toxic to your liver. And the way that it is toxic is it inhibits your body from making the very substance that helps the nerve function. And this is well documented in the scientific literature. We know that if you take a statin drug for six months, your average IQ drops by four to six points or so, depending on the study. So this is not, this is not unknown, but apparently it was to his cardiologist. And so then he comes to me basically starved and poisoned, and he's got all kinds of medical problems as a result. And I've now identified what the problem is. Okay. And Interesting. So that I have to remediate it in the obvious way, which is stop poisoning yourself and, you know, eat good fats. And lo and behold, in six months, he doesn't need to go in a nursing home and he stopped shaking mostly. And we're basically good. Well, that's great. That's good insight into your thinking. Okay. It's a good example. Has, um, have there been... Uh, any number of substantial people you couldn't help that were a mystery to you, no matter what you did? Uh, there's always that. The main issue, you know, it's interesting. It's a good question because... Uh, I finally got one good one. <laughs> yeah. The, the main <laughs> thing, and this is something I've heard in medicine, there's no incurable disease. There's incurable people. And I definitely met a lot of incurable people. And most of them... It's because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't participate in this process that I'm talking about, which is tell me your story. And so instead of that, this person would come in and say, you know, I'd say, what's happened? They say, I have Parkinson's. And how long have you had it? Say four years. And the doctor did, a, you know, he did a biopsy, he did EEGs, he did nerve conduction studies, and he found out that I have Parkinson's. And, um, you know, it gave me these drugs and I don't like the side effects. And so now I'm really in bad shape and I'm coming to you. So what happened to you four years ago? And then he says, why is that relevant? I have Parkinson's. You, I heard that you're good at treating Parkinson's. Mm. And I, I say, well, it's still, it would be interesting to me to find out, you know, what happened to you four years ago. And then he's so frustrated. But I already told you I got Parkinson's then. You know, and you said you had treatments that might be able to help, or I read something, or I heard somebody, my friend said he heard a talk by you saying you helped somebody with Parkinson's. This is so frustrating for me because I already told you I have Parkinson's. What's the trouble? And at that point, I know that I can't help them. Oh, so if you wanted to be confrontational in that example, you would say, You've decided that you have Parkinson's. I'm asking you to see if. Perhaps maybe it's not that or something else. I guess maybe that's the way to put it. Story. And I, the story leads me to the, to the therapeutic intervention. And what I found through experience is that some people, for whatever reason, and I could do you know, psychological speculation on why, but they seem to be wedded to their disease or their oh. diagnosis. And again, I 
you know, I've had, I've had, I would admit a lot of difficulty, A, moving them off that position. And then what I've noticed is if I can't move them off that position through the way that I try to empathize with people and tell them their story and even reflect with them, sometimes it's true. It doesn't work. I know that I can't help them. So yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's fine. They can go somewhere else. Well, I've seen the power of labels, especially recently. Like, uh, you know, I was giving an example with this COVID stuff, uh, elective surgeries. And I remember thinking when, um, you know, I don't know who said that elective surgeries would be banned. I thought, oh, okay, plastic surgery. But their definition of it was, you know, cancer screenings and all kinds of stuff that, you know, I, I don't know, it would kind of be hard to, to call that elective so I realize the power of labels, but I think a lot of people, I don't know, they're just used to labels and being labeled and that helps them. And um, maybe that's why they're wedded to them or married to them in these cases. You know? Yeah, except the problem is, uh, and I, if you read my cancer book in the last section, I actually went over the whole issue of screening for cancer. And I concluded just based on reading the science that there's actually no evidence that screening for cancer improves anybody's outcome. Oh. Now, pe people may be surprised at that, and that's fine. I'm, I, you know, I say a lot of things that apparently people are surprised at, but, but I can assure you I didn't get this because I made it up. I simply looked at the studies based on, you know, so this, this number of people did mammograms and this number of people didn't, and what happened to them, and there was no benefit. And the only thing that really happens is the people who have mammograms end up with a lot more surgeries and a lot more treatment than the people who don't have mammograms, but no evidence of improved outcomes. And I'd be happy to be wrong about that, but if, I, if somebody thinks I'm wrong, they should send me the study that convinces me otherwise, because I don't write these things lightly. I look at the actual published data and the published science, and there's very there's very clear reasons for that, um, which I don't know if I need to get into. But that's one of the problems of saying, well, it's a, it's a horrible shame that we stopped doing screening for cancer because unless you can prove to me that screening for cancer actually works, maybe it's not so horrible that we stopped doing it. In fact, okay. one of the interesting things, and this was written by one of the people who I think every actual literate human being should read, a guy named uh, Ivan Illich. And he actually uh, talked about in a book called Medical Nemesis, that the only two times in, in recent modern history that there was actually a strike of doctors, one was in the UK and one I think was in Israel. It, and they struck for, you know, better pay and hours, the usual thing. Uh, it turns out that when they were on strike, the death rate went down. And the, the repercussion of that was they both settled for less, for less pay than they originally asked for because the government said, you know what, we may not need you as much as you think we do. So we're going to actually downgrade our offer. And so that's, they, they don't strike anymore because that's what happened when they did. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, if you want to give uh, an opinion, it's up to you. But what is your, your thoughts in general about, uh, you know, this, the, the whole COVID situation? Uh, I think I'll pass on that, except to say in the last week or so, a dear friend of mine named Sally Fallon and I wrote a book, and you can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And it's only pre-order now, but the book is called The Contagion Myth. And you can read everything you need to know about what we think about this in that book. Okay. The Contagion Myth. Okay, I'm making it, I'm making it out now. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, Tom, what's the best, best way for people to dip their toe in and start learning more about you and your works? Where can they go? What do you recommend? DrTomCowan.com. That's the Cowan best. is C-O-W-A-N. Correct. Okay. Very All right. Good. Yeah, All right. No, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Simon, thank okay, you. Thank you so thank much. You. Okay, take care. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.